Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, we are what we like to call Journalism 2.0. We're Ovis. And uh, my name is Tracy Grant. I am one of the co-founders of Ovis. I am here uh, with another one of the co-founders, Elsa Ramon. Hey there, Elsa. Hi, Tracy. Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> you too. Always a pleasure. Um, we are doing our regular Sunday night show every week. We are trying to reach out to our audience so we can have a little bit of a chat about um, some of the things that are wrong in the media right now, um, how we can make the information that uh, is being put out there um, more real, more authentic. And that that really hits home tonight because our subject matter is all about deep fakes. Now, this is a term that you've probably heard of um, uh, over the last year or so. It, it has become big news where um, a lot of the information and especially video um, you're seeing sometimes have been manipulated so that no longer can you look at video on television or online and know that what you're seeing is absolutely um it was shot absolutely uh the way that you're seeing it right now sometimes things have been tweaked um to uh present a story in a different way and um and I, is not necessarily authentic so uh that's what we're talking about tonight and we have a really awesome guest joining us jack policar is right here with elsa and i tonight how are you jack <laughs> it is great to hear you and see you and um and i'm i'm excited for us to talk about this tonight and i'm wondering um if you don't mind could you share a little bit about your background just for the audience absolutely so i've been working in early stage startups uh between denver boulder and san francisco for the last eight and a half years um a bunch of different verticals mainly sales marketing um, branding partnerships, but have been all around uh, the ecosystem. Um, worked with a lot of founders, um, have been a part of a lot of different types of communities in those different areas, and um, just have experienced a lot of uh, what people are now understanding as deep fakes and that technology and, and seeing how fast that technology is moving. And um, I'm also very interested uh, with politics, and I'd stay very current with what's going on, and um, am excited to talk about the overlap of technology and sort of politics and and information as a whole. So, um, looking forward to the conversation well, tonight. I am I am very much looking forward to diving into those topics with you, Jack. Now that you shared a little bit about yourself, I want you to stand by because what I want to do is bring in our chief fact checker. Mm -hmm. Of course, fact checkers. I think we told you with Ovis are really the backbone of our journalism 2.0, our news organization, because uh, nothing will get through without our community of fact checkers. And what we're doing right now is growing our fact checkers so that they can check for things like misinformation, disinformation, mm -hmm. fake news, and what is sure to become more of a menacing problem uh, of deep fakes and, and altered video, manipulated pictures, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Our, our I don't know. Are we calling him our chief fact checker? Because, <laughs> because I like to call I, him a superstar personally. I mean, really, he really is our very first um, Ovis approved fact checker in our community. And he really is going to be the head of all of our fact checkers once our community starts to grow of fact checkers. But this is what we're going to rely on heavily in the Ovis community are fact checkers because uh, Tracy, as you know, uh, as I know, as our other co-founders, some of them know working in television news, print, radio, that one of the things, and you can tell me otherwise, that was always missing in our newsrooms was a dedicated unit of fact checkers. It really went through several processes of, you know, uh, copy editing. We had our producers and executive producers and so on. Everybody put eyes on it, but the art of fact checking and, and the utilization of real fact checkers who have, you know, studied this and, you know, been certified and that type of thing 
just really hasn't been a part of a, of, of a newsroom or news organization. And I think we're seeing now kind of the, um, uh, of what that's kind of created now that we have um, as far as where people get their news on all the social media platforms. And now it's like, you don't know what's real, what's not, uh, what's been manipulated, what's not. So Karim, our chief fact checker for Ovis, I want to bring Hello. you in first before we um, uh, get into the deep interview with with Jack Policar, okay. because I want you to set the stage for people who are joining us for the first time to find out uh, how important it is uh, that fact checking become the norm in news organizations. Right. So I think, well, deep fake is really challenging fact checkers and journalists in general to understand. It will be fact um, challenging journalists and fact checkers in general. Um, to understand what is real and what is fake. Um, currently, it's not that um, widespread. We don't see too many deep fakes being published online, um, but that number will be growing as people get better computers, as we get easier software to use these deep fake technologies. It will be more easy to use Trump's face on someone else's um, you know, face. So those type of things we need to start on early and to understand how we can combat the deep fake when it happens, and that's what we have to be working. Currently, there are some techno some technological um, solutions to deep fakes, but they're not um, foolproof, and we have to work on that. Well, um, you know, I'm sure that's going to be uh, very difficult uh, initially to once people figure out uh, on all these platforms how they can actually make deep fakes themselves and the technology improves for people to be able to use this for their own consumption on a, you know a private consumption versus a company consumption um i expect that that problem to permeate through all of our sources and resources for news um, do you think just in your opinion as a fact checker that deep fakes pose even uh, a worse threat than just basic misinformation, disinformation, you know, fake news. Um, well, I think they're kind of... Does it have the potential to, to create more damage? They're kind of intertwined with each other. So deep fake is a sort of misinformation, right? It, it, is, it, is a, it is a way of spreading false narratives and um, it, it, it can be used to... Um, to spread, you know, it could be used as a joke. You know, we have Nicolas Cage on, on a, all sorts of people as a joke, but it also can be used to, um, to spread wrong information. That's what we should be working towards and try to understand how we can combat that. Um, and like I said, there are right now there are tools that are being used to, uh, to see if a video is being, uh, is a deep pick or not. Um, but what we, what we as people should be looking for is just anything we see online, we should be be curious if it's true or not. It doesn't have to be a deep fake, it could be anything. So we should always be curious, like I always say, always be curious and always try to um, understand for ourselves if it's true or not. Absolutely. I mean, you have to admit, I do. I mean, I've worked in, um, I worked in television for 20 years and when I first started, I would have thought it would be impossible to, to really manipulate video in the way that I'm seeing it now. I mean, it, uh, you can literally, and we've talked about some of these things. I mean, there was the Nancy Pelosi uh, video um, not that long ago that uh, made the rounds online. And um, where even her speech though, was slowed I down. Mean, Are you referring to that, the one where her speech was slowed down and it made her appear exactly. that she was impaired in some exactly. way. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and obviously that was put out there um, for a purpose, uh, people who were against Pelosi and uh, on the other side of this election were trying to um, to put this video out there and make it seem like, um, you know, here she is, the, the head of, um, you know, of the Democratic Party in the, in the House, and she is somehow caught um, uh, drunk is what yeah. people were trying to say um, on video. And, and it absolutely was not true. But with the technology we have out there today, it really 
can make you look at it and go, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, I mean, a lot of people might not even question it. They're seeing it in front of them and they think, oh, OK, that happened. So so it is dangerous, is it not, Karen? It definitely is dangerous. And video right now for us is is concrete evidence, right? We, we see video as concrete evidence. And it sometimes isn't. If you if it's manipulated, it's definitely not concrete, and it's sometimes very hard to see if it's manipulated or not. I remember one where um, Jim Acosta was accused of swatting someone's hand away. Remember that one? And that was also kind of sped up a, a millisecond or something like that. And it kind of seemed that his hand was going down much faster, faster than it actually was. So it's just these small manipulations that it's really hard to catch, really hard to see. Um, but there are possible, there are ways of seeing them and there are ways of understanding if they're real or not. So Karim, I, knowing this, I know most of us say to ourselves, maybe we see something that just seems just incredulous. Like this can't be real. You're seeing this video, like, come on, this isn't real. But are you finding in, especially in this last election cycle that People, and I think we've talked about this before, in fact, we talked about it last week, people are being led by their emotions and their political affiliations, and they're throwing reason and common sense out the window and turning to their emotions instead of asking themselves the questions when they see things or read things online. What do you think would help people uh, say to themselves when they sit down online and start to consume some news if they see something they don't they're not quite sure of or even if they see something and immediately react to it because it resonates with them either way uh what would you suggest those people say to themselves i think that's the the the, the big question right how, how do we stop people from sharing things unknowingly that are wrong information and um i don't think there is just one answer to that it's always being curious, always trying to see if it's true or not before resharing, reposting. But sometimes emotions just, you know, they come and go. Sometimes emotion it, it gets gets over you. And um, I think what how I think about it is if I agree with something, I look at it five times more, because generally some things you agree with, you tend to miss the small nuances there. So if you agree with it, you should check it out again, and um, and and then post it if you want. That's but, great um, advice, actually. I, I never <laughs> thought about that, but I, I would think that, you know, that, that you could now see how maybe echo chambers are right. created because if somebody agrees with something, then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they uh, maybe, ten, like you said, yeah. miss some of the red flags that might be, te that maybe should be telling right. them that they should check mm -hmm. this out. So, yeah. I, you know, yeah. that's a good thing people can ask themselves when they read news. Yeah. Yeah, I know I have to say this and I know my mom will probably kill me for saying it, but, um, you know, I, I've seen her many times uh, post things, you know, she sees something, it resonates with her before she even has questioned it, you know, she's putting it out there on Facebook. And, and that's something to remember is that sometimes the people who have created these deep fakes um, have a motive, but the people who are are spreading the information and sharing the video are often doing it unwittingly. I mean, they they don't necessarily have the ability um, to really sit down and think about, OK, you know, what am I seeing here and um, is this for real? You know, what is there to be gained um, by putting this information out there? You know, I mean, Ovis, uh, that's what we're all about is talking about um, biases and, um, you know, what people are trying to gain by putting information out there into the world that is not necessarily based in fact. And so she and I have this conversation on a regular basis where I will say, <laughs> um, have you checked that out, mom, that thing that you just posted? <laughs> Could you just, I'll Google it for you. Let me Google it. And then it, if it, if it doesn't check out, then perhaps you could delete that. But that, I mean, that's just an example of people who, I mean, it's all, it's video. So people say, oh, I can see this thing. So that means it's real. But as we know now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's real. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, video is no longer concrete evidence. It's it's mm. it's evidence, but it's it's not always concrete, and it's always it, it always has to be double checked. It always has to have have another source of it. Maybe a picture with it would be great. You know, a second video of the incident or whatever would be also great. So you know, we have to have multiple sources verifying um, whatever we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Kara, <laughs> by the way, Tracy, I know that because I've had my mom say, you know, I saw on Facebook and like when she says those first few words, I'm like, all right, that's yeah, the, the, I saw on Facebook and then you right there. I'm like, okay, go, Ooh, here we go. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, do you me. have I that issue as well, Kara? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's always an issue, always an issue. <laughs> All right, uh, Karim, thank you so very much. I uh, appreciate thank you too, always at the beginning of the show. I always love having you to, to remind us to keep our heads about us, keep our wits mm -hmm. about us when we're consuming stuff online, news, videos, pictures, whatever it may be. You know, again, that's why we are all working so hard to create, or why we did create Ovis and our founder, Linton Johnson, uh, created Ovis because we want to make sure that we have a place not only for accurate news, but fact check news, uh, mm -hmm. news that is free of disinformation, misinformation, and, and fake news because of our team of fact checkers that will over time just continue to grow and grow and grow. And, and this we're going to do globally. So mm -hmm. we're hoping that it's not just here in the United States, but once our community begins to grow all over the world, we have fact checkers and journalists and community members who just want news that's Ovis approved and fact checked will be all over the world. So we'll have fact checkers in countries in Africa one day and we'll have, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in Japan, wherever mm -hmm. it may be. So um, that's what we're hoping to do so that people all over the world can have a place to go and without all the noise, without having to second guess what they're right. reading. Right. This is the way that we at Ovis plan to hold journalists accountable. Um, this is what we're all about, because uh, right now we're seeing way too many things that are not at all grounded, in fact, and are presented as news, as fact. And, um, and what we're p doing here at Ovis is making sure the information we put out there is the real thing and uh Karim is here to help us and um and our guest tonight jack policar he knows a little bit about this subject jack are you out there <laughs> yeah well, jack we're, we're gonna bring jack back oh. in we, we introduced mm -hmm. you to him mm -hmm. at the beginning of the show and mm -hmm. then we brought Karim, our chief fact checker back in to talk about in general fake news and deep fakes and uh one of the things jack that struck me when you and I talked a little bit before our interview today is that mm -hmm. you um, you seem to have uh, a pretty strong reaction when it came to deep fakes and, mm -hmm. and not only your feelings, but <coughs> also your experiences and, and what you think uh, the danger is and how real the danger is from these deep fakes on mm -hmm. the trust of the public in journalism. Absolutely. So when, um, again, great points in the first segment, um, Karen, loved some of the, the uh, points you made just about looking at it as um, it's a, a new medium. It's a new medium of fake news. We look at uh, written journalism. We look at images that are tampered with, with basic Photoshop. And I think this is just the new, very high tech medium. Um, when I'm looking at like coming from a, a design background, it's like uh, manipulating words and typefaces, really basic and easy image is that next step. Now video, I think that's what's really scary is because like you mentioned, video has always been perceived as that's real. How can that not be real? Mm -hmm. But I think even stepping back from that, I remember there was a video of um, uh, someone who was armed in the street in Brooklyn and uh, he was shot. And the way the, the first video looked is it was um, just cops shooting an unarmed person. And then later on, there were other angles of that video that then showed he was actually armed and, and this was more of a, a routine situation that, that may not have been a shooting of an unarmed person. 
But that makes me really look at this situation of it is perspective. And like what was just talked about, you have to look at things from multiple sources. You can't take things at face value anymore. And, and I think that's what the real worry and danger of deep fakes is, is simply that psychology of, oh, if this is put in, in the world, it must be real. And it's that sort of knee-jerk reaction to, if you see a video, you're like, oh my gosh, people have to know about this. And okay. then there are going to be certain people who are just going to take that knee-jerk reaction and not have, to me, what is a necessary step-by-step -step process, which is um, something I actually learned when I was studying uh, in, in school, political science. One of our teachers was just like, every single source, you have to have it backed up by five different news sources. I don't want you to cite anything in a paper or even a discussion that you don't have the other side of the story mm -hmm. and then another side because all of those different perspectives are very important in creating a dialogue and, and finding a, a truth in a situation. So getting back to the deep fakes, I think it's really important to understand that it is simply just a new medium. And uh, although it is a scary medium and, and I think the the barrier to technology is going to to become lower and lower. Like you said, 20 years ago, working in video, you would have never thought that this could be a reality, but we're seeing it as sort of a hard, it, it takes a lot of processing power and video editing skills and the ability to, to rework this type of media. I mean, we're, we're going to see high school kids being able to build deep fakes. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I'd say in the next three years, which is scary, but that's why it's important that we build out these systems sadly train people it's tough because it takes a lot of energy like we always talk about this I, I was just speaking with my girlfriend and she brought up a article about something that was happening in california i'm like yeah did you double check that with like this article and this article and this article she's like no like i didn't have the time and that's an understandable reaction because everybody's busy and it's exhausting reading something and wanting to share it but being like oh shoot like before i even talk about this even if it's from a reputable source, it's now our responsibility to say, well, I probably should look into like what the other side of that is or if there's another side. And so I think that's sort of one piece of the puzzle of how we start addressing actually how to combat this. I, I think there's technology. I think there's what you're doing at Ovis, which is um, incorporating fact checkers and those third party people to sort of do that legwork for you of saying, okay, we're going to check other sources. We're going to make sure that there's a real source of truth within something that's coming out right now. But, but Jack, um, I, I also, to that point, I want to mm -hmm. point out that not only are we um, going to grow our fact-checking community mm -hmm. to, uh, on a global level, but we're also relying on technology. It's another reason, mm -hmm. I mean, our fact-checkers alone are, are is something that makes us unique in the news industry, but also we're using technology. We're using blockchain yeah. technology because as you know, blockchain technology is immutable, which means it cannot be changed. Mm -hmm. So the information that is put onto the blockchain, whether it's a story or video no. or picture, <coughs> have been fact-checked, they've been verified, and they've been verified by multiple fact-checkers in our Ovis community before they actually make it onto our blockchain and live forever mm -hmm. uh, as something that's verified, accurate news mm -hmm. and cannot be changed. So we have a couple of tools in our arsenal here <laughs> to <laughs> combat fake news and everything that comes with it. So uh, we're making sure we're, we're, being, uh, we're as ironclad as possible when it comes to the truth and, and making sure people have a place to come in the Ovis community to get that. So yes, but that that's a very good point I think you made. And uh, Tracy probably agrees that, you know, you're reading whatever social media platform you get mm -hmm. your news from and you read a good article and you're like, wow, I wanna share that with everybody. And it doesn't occur to most people, well, maybe I should check a couple of other newspapers mm -hmm. that did this story too. I, I, I can tell you right now, I mean, I, I you know, read articles and went, oh gosh, I got to share that with some friends, maybe not mm -hmm. publicly on social media, but share it, you know, in private with other people. But yeah, that, that takes a lot. So hopefully Ovis takes that work yeah. out for you <laughs> and you yeah, have to and, rely and on that. Create, create that trust. Cause I, I see that as the overall problem as the internet has expanded 
it's so it's like I could start a news website before I go to bed tonight. I can build a website <laughs> and build an RSS feed and then have it come in from literally a hundred different blogs and then insert my own blog posts within that feed and create whatever narrative I want. We, we talk about that in my group of friends all the time of in this day and age of technology and information, you can have articles to believe whatever you want to believe. And I think that's why misinformation is so dangerous right now, especially with this, the, the latest election. You are going to believe what you want to believe and you're going to be able to have an arsenal of, of collateral material and conversations to back up what you believe. Case in point, I mean, flat earthers, I think we can say the earth is round, but <laughs> wait you know, a sec. I'm just... you know, so, <laughs> no. so anyways, the idea is that even the flat earther community, we've seen it growing. And these people are like, well, we have so many people. I can show you a hundred articles mm. that shows that the earth is real. And it, and that to me is a really good point of uh, sort of the danger of the internet and that the need to be able to look at different organizations, look at different ways of thinking and be like, okay, again, how can I be open to this? But again, how do we find those areas of this is, this is objectively truthful. This is a, a fact rather than a opinion by a large group of people. And, and I think that's where things are going to get really difficult. I think we've sort of reached a point in the, um, in the web and internet and just greater sharing of, of information around the world that we can't go back. We can't go back to the days of my grandmother where she was like, we got the San Francisco Chronicle and that was it. Like that's <laughs> where you got your truth and everybody believed it because everybody on the block read that and watched the one news station at night. And like, I, I hear the stories and I'm like, oh my gosh, that sounds so much better. <laughs> <laughs> Easier at least. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, I really... I really think that we're in a stage where the government actually does need to get involved in a way that we start building out systems and structure that um, actually we, we can trust news again. Because I, I don't think it's a bipartisan thing. I think it's a, you're going to believe what you're going to believe and you can find those facts or, or uh, collateral to back up your opinion mm -hmm. and we have to find a way that I have friends who are Republican Democrat uh, just complete anarchists they hate everything about the government <laughs> but the fact is when you ask like do you trust the election process right now do you trust the news system I don't know anybody who's like oh yeah I trust our complete right, right. media system like well, there there's is one thing they can all agree on Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> exactly. No, exactly. Whatever side yeah. you're on, at <laughs> That's least you true. guys all agree that right now, <laughs> our information system, our news and information and the way we get it is broken. So at least yeah. there's common ground there. But before we let you go, Jack, we wanted to ask you if you have any personal experiences, anybody, either yourself or anybody you know, that's been affected by fake news or deep fakes or manipulated pictures or any kind of that experience or some, um, an experience that you've read about that really resonated with you yeah i mean okay so this is actually a very good point i'm i'm a big believer of of looking at network change of looking at sort of uh societal um impact and and what especially what news does and and i think the problem with misinformation is it spreads like wildfire and even when something is disproven the impacts can still be astronomical. So let's say there's a deep fake that went out. And even let's say, of course, because that's the thing, even when deep fakes get really good, some big, big video, there's always going to be, be a way to prove that it was a manipulated video. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is let's say that video comes out and it's pr completely proven to be a deep fake a month later. That's 30 days where it has time to ruminate. And, and this isn't a little smoldering ember, especially if it's a big video or a big article or something, then that has a whole incubation period where it spreads like wildfire. And that's to me where the damage is, because even when it's disproven, that idea, it's like that movie Inception, that idea mm -hmm. has already been put in your head. Mm -hmm. And that idea is going to 
uh, uh, in initiate conversations and those conversations are going to initiate actions and you have no clue what the network effect of that is. And, and I can, I can say, I'll, I'll bring that back to a personal story of it's, it's with family as well. And <laughs> always my question of someone being like, Oh, like, what did you see this article and and like it, it usually it can be my mom and like we, we speak a lot and i'm like where where'd you read the article mm -hmm. and she's like okay here and i was like okay did you read any other articles to back that up she said no but i talked with this friend and i was like oh well like and she was like yeah but then we talked about it at book club and like she's great she's an incredibly intelligent woman and mm -hmm. her friends are great but it's that aspect of thinking of like literally the butterfly effect of the fact that she may not have looked at the entire circle of that story and the other five perspectives that may have been included in that story and then her telling that one friend who then told five other people and then them going to their book club where they have 10 friends those and again you have that network effect coming from a single action and i I just, I truly always try to challenge everybody around me to try to figure out your own system. Maybe it's reading five or six different news sources. I know a lot of people who are just like, oh, I'm a New York Times fan. That's all I have. That's what I have on my phone. That's what I read. I'm like, you're going to have a very siloed uh, understanding of everything. And like, people are like, I could never watch Fox News or I only watch Fox News. And I'm like, if you're a one network person, you are going to have a very set view of everything that's going on and and again i that's why i could say to anybody watching this is it, it's a habit try to build into a habit where you're like okay if i'm going to be scrolling news how do i look at different things uh max is a perfect example he actually works at ovis and max always talks about how much news he reads and i know max he again studied political science and was taught like you're reading all of these different sources and it may take an extra 10 minutes you may read two articles instead of five articles, but at least you can say that those two articles that you read, and, and maybe it's finding those two articles that you're really passionate about, you're able to say, I, I am very confident in sharing the information from these articles rather than, a, oh, look at that headline. And, and I think that's gonna be a big issue for my generation because we are that, that Twitter, Twitter length generation of we don't wanna read a 10 minute article and we definitely don't want to read five <laughs> other articles that are 10 minutes to back it up. So mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of work to be done. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I could share stories all night from friends to family to even looking at businesses, how businesses now rely on some of this information. And I've, I've seen startups that I've worked for be put in really compromising situations because they, they took a stand, they, they took a political stand on a certain piece of information. And if that information changes, you're not just affecting yourself. You can't, my, my mom couldn't go to her book club and be like, hey you guys, I messed up. Look at these four other articles. It's a lot harder when you have the livelihood of 200 employees and you're trying to go to your network of, of 10,000 users and be like, oh, hey, we goofed up. <laughs> that's a, that's a, it's tough because you're also seeing these large organizations making really solid political stands. And I think as, as marketing and brands are evolving, especially with Gen Z, they know that they can't not take a side, but they have to take some stand within what's happening in the world. And, um, and that, that creates riskier, uh, riskier moves that affect larger organizations of people. So again, I think I, I could leave this talk with telling people, take the extra 10 or 20 minutes to mm -hmm. check your own sources and try to find organizations like this is really a shameless plug. Like you guys did not tell me to say this, but like <laughs> find people like Ovis who are doing the work to find truth and find that ground of, of real reporting that isn't just based on, on a single opinion. Well, as long as we're doing shameless plugs, <laughs> then I will say then, since we all agree, the consensus here that we're doing shameless plugs, uh, part of the part of the structure of Ovis, the, the, we are to, tokenized. So, you know, you talk about how people 
um, you know, especially your generation, but I, I don't think it's just your generation, anybody mm. who actually gets their news on social media platforms like Twitter or whatever, mm -hmm. um, you don't have time to read are those are all those yeah. articles or you don't want to make the time to read all those articles and compare them all and come to your own uh, conclusion. But in the Obis community, because we're tokenized and everything is tokenized, people will be re, uh, paid to mm -hmm. read the articles. They yep. will be rewarded financially for consuming more and doing more of the research to come to a better conclusion of what they're reading. So right, and calling calling out the information, <laughs> uh, calling out the information that is not correct. You mm -hmm. know, I mean that's what right. Ovis is all about. Uh, you can see something on there and you as a, as a member of the Ovis community can say, you know what, that doesn't ring true to me. And, um, and you bring it up and we'll be able to get to the bottom of it. You know, members can sort of can fact check each other in a way. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we're hoping. And we'll be able to have this kind of a community um, who will be able to work together to make sure that the information that, that we put out there mm -hmm. is absolutely true. Yeah, Tracy's so talking we... about, you know, journalists will be held accountable. Because mm -hmm. if the journalists aren't on the up and up and they didn't do their due diligence and use the fact checkers to check their work and then have us have the, you know, it, it approved to be on, on the OVA site, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they will lose their privileges and ultimately not be in the community. But it is up to our community members and the fact checkers, like Tracy said, to call them out. And mm -hmm. you also, you are also rewarded for that as well. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Jack. Absolutely. Really nice to meet you. And it's, you know, it's nice to know that Max has friends. <laughs> he does. He doesn't, he doesn't work all the time. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll oh, take your word Matt. for that. <laughs> Matt, when, when he's not playing the harpsichord, right? All right. Is that what he plays? Is that what he plays, the harpsichord? That is it. <laughs> One of these days, Tracy, I'm telling you, we, we, always, we always tease him about that ever since we had that show where he talked about you know, how he plays the harpsichord. One of these days, we're going to have him on the show just so we can yes. take us out playing the harpsichord. Yes. we got to yeah. see it at this point. I mean... Uh, harpsichord, <laughs> Christmas music, Christmas carols. I think this is the time it's, we're bringing Max all, in. <laughs> you know what, though? Um, one of the things, Tracy, I really loved that, that Jack pointed out was that uh, communities like Ovis, what we're doing, using blockchain technology, uh, uh, tokenization, using oh, our uh, world of fact checkers and journalists and the community members, mm -hmm. um, we want to get to a point where people are saying, is this fact or fake? I don't know. Just Ovis it. Go mm -hmm. to Ovis because we're trying to do the work here for you so that you can just tune out the noise. Exactly. And know that what you're getting is immutable information that's been fact checked multiple times mm -hmm. and it's not going to change. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, I, I mean, hopefully we're setting a precedent that will change the way uh, the the entire media landscape really because it really has gotten to a point i mean you and i know this personally i mean you can you can be an absolutely great reporter out there and still um that final product um that ends up on the air or in the paper or something um may not be what you wanted it to be because um you know a lot of people have their say in what is ultimately put out there. And sometimes they, it changes the, the original meaning of the article and how, how fact-based it really is. So uh, yeah, Ovis, we're, we're going to shake things up. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, yes, and shake out all the mm -hmm. misinformation, disinformation, fake news, mm -hmm. deep fakes, and everything that comes with it. Before we go, though, Tracy, um, I do want to make sure we invite people to go to the Ovis community at ovis.news mm -hmm. because we are actively looking for uh, fact checkers to join our community uh, once you go through the process and become an approved fact checker. We're looking for you. And we're also mm -hmm. looking for journalists as well who would like to join our community mm -hmm. and just people who want to be community members, those people who want to get paid for reading all the articles mm -hmm. and consuming the information on our community, on our site at ovis.news. If you want to be any one of those, you can go to our website, ovis.news, and get on our waiting list to join our community. Mm -hmm. It'll be worth your while to be one of the very, very early members right now. 
to do that. Absolutely. And I also want to point out, I want to make sure people know when we say journalists um, working for Ovis, yes, we are talking about people like you and me who did work in the field of journalism, but you don't have to have that on your resume to become a journalist at Ovis. Um, you just have to want to be able to learn the truth and, and write it, put it out there for other people to read and to learn from, you know, you Serve don't have to, exactly, exactly. You don't have to have worked at a newspaper or a television station or a magazine to be considered an Ovis journalist. But you do have to get your work fact checked once you are Absolutely. by the fact checkers, multiple fact checkers. And then when it goes out there, it is Ovis. It is Ovis certified. So, <laughs> exactly. Again, go to our website, ovis.news, and check out what we have to offer, and hopefully you'll become a member of the community in one way or another. So, uh, Tracy, we'll be back next Sunday. Next Sunday, we'll be right here. Join us, everyone. Until then, have a great night, everybody. Thanks for joining us for Ovis's Zap Chat.